Hydroelectric systems work by transferring the energy of moving water into electricity using a turbine and a generator. They do this by exploiting the water's potential energy, the water's fall, along with some kinetic energy, the water's flow. The fall of a river is referred to as head, and it's a term you'll hear a lot when we talk about hydro. You'll notice that we'll mention it far more than flow for important reasons, which we'll come on to later. In essence, all small hydro systems take some water out of a river or stream, it then passes through and turns the turbine and re-enters the river lower down. They don't have very high dams or reservoirs and so don't significantly alter the nature of the river in the way that large hydro schemes do. The smallest hydro systems commercially available are about 600 watts. One of these would provide most of the electricity for a single average house over the course of a year. A fairly typical size for a community hydro system is 30 kilowatts. This kind of turbine could supply the electricity needs of around 50 average homes. At the top of the scale of small hydro are systems of about 5 megawatts. One of these will supply enough electricity for around 8,000 homes. Now this may not sound very small at all and the name small hydro can be slightly misleading as a 5 megawatt system is actually quite big, the equivalent to two large wind turbines. But we describe them as small to differentiate them from the industrial scale hydropower schemes that sometimes involve the damming of rivers and flooding of entire river valleys to create reservoirs. These commonly go up to 1000 megawatts or more. Unlike wind power and solar power, hydropower generates energy almost all the time, varying slightly with seasonal alterations in flow. This means that over a year, a one megawatt hydro installation would generate far more electricity than a one megawatt wind turbine or solar array because it would be generating almost all the time at or near to its maximum capacity. Hydro is also a fairly low maintenance technology and has a longer working life than other renewable technologies. Typically, they last 30 to 50 years as opposed to 25 to 30 years for wind and solar. As such, although the upfront costs can be high, income, once up and running, is steady, predictable and long-lasting. Here's an example of how one typical small hydro system works. Water is diverted from the river into a specially dug open channel. In the illustration, there's a weir at this point which raises the level of the river, but this isn't always the case. The rest of the water continues on downstream. All hydro systems need to be designed to make sure that the part of the river that doesn't pass through the turbine always has adequate flow for fish and other aquatic life. The diverted water then passes through a tank where silt and small stones are caught to prevent them entering the machinery. If the river is relatively silt-free, this may not be necessary. There's also a grid structure here that sieves out floating debris like branches and rubbish. Sometimes the water flows directly to the turbine itself, but in this illustration it first enters a section of pipe, which can be quite long if the turbine house is some distance from the intake. Turbines are large pieces of machinery. A one megawatt turbine would weigh several tons. The water turns the turbine as it passes through or over it, depending on the design. They come in many forms, such as Archimedes screw, Pelton wheel, and cross flow. Different designs suit different circumstances. Next to the turbine is a generator. As the turbine turns, it powers the generator, which generates the electricity. The system will also need an electricity substation that will feed the energy generated by the hydro plant into the grid. After the water's passed through the turbine house, it re-enters the river. Not all rivers are suitable for hydro. And as we've said, this is because they work by exploiting the water's potential energy, the water's fall or head, along with a smaller amount of its kinetic energy, the water's flow. The fact that it's about head rather than flow is critical. Many people naturally assume that any fast flowing river would be a good site for hydropower. But in the absence of significant head, there's unlikely to be sufficient energy to exploit, even in a fast flowing river. The head of the river can be natural. For example, a stream flowing downhill 
or it can be artificially generated by building a weir or dam. While there are systems that operate mainly on flow, they require a very large river with a very high flow rate and large volumes of water need to be extracted. Sites like this are unlikely to be suitable for community scale projects. What this adds up to is this. Large rivers with significant falls are the best sites for hydro because they have high head and high flow. Rivers with low head and low flow are no use at all. Rivers with high head but low flow can be a decent bet, but only as long as they do actually flow most of the time. Some small fast flowing rivers dry up during the summer. Large rivers like the Trent or Severn, which flow over flattish terrain, are characterised by low head but very high flow. These can be good sites, but you have to extract quite a lot of water to achieve decent generation. So you might struggle with costs, planning and licensing. If you're prospecting for a site for a hydro plant, a good question to ask is if there is, or ever has been, a water mill on your river. If so, then it's definitely worth an initial investigation. The river Frome in Somerset once powered a string of mills that were used in the wool trade, with some of them dating from Saxon times. Today, many have been brought back to life as hydro plants. One of the main questions people ask about hydro is what happens to the fish? And it's a good point. Fish passing through turbines are sometimes killed. So most hydro plants are designed to keep fish out using bypassing channels, sieve-like screens, eel pipes, and even fish ladders. These are a series of small pools, one above another, that migrating fish like salmon can use to jump up and bypass the turbine. All hydro schemes, no matter how small, must be licensed by the Environment Agency, who will expect to see plans on how the river's wildlife will be protected, both when the scheme is being built and after operation. And this is not just fish we need to worry about, but amphibians, crustaceans, mammals, insects and plants too, the whole river community in fact. I hope this introduction to hydro has answered some questions and given you a positive starting point for further investigation. Thank you for watching.